If you were to pick up a dictionary, a, a medical dictionary, preferably, and you'd look up the word allergy, you'd find that most of them, all of them, will basically concur, agree in giving you in more or less these same words the definition that an allergy is a hypersensitivity disorder that affects the human immune system. Since it's a disorder, it's something bad, undesirable, it's a kind of a sickness, it's an ailment, and a person can be said to be allergic to something or to suffer from an allergy of his immune system, reacts in a hypersensitive way, in an exaggerated way, to some harmless substance which is normally found in the environment. People can be allergic to various things. Uh, most common allergies, uh, people are aller allergic to bee venom, to eggs, to gluten, to peanuts, to all sorts of things, and new allergies are still appearing. And amongst the newest, the most recent allergies that afflict mostly Catholics, there is one, and this is an allergic intolerance of that mariological truth of Our Lady's co-redemption. Of course, we speak, I uh, use that word uh, allergy in a broad sense, kind of jokingly, but it's true. Amongst many Catholics, especially ones who have uh, who feel themselves to have studied a lot of theology and to be well-versed in theology, especially in modern theology, a certain allergy and allergic intolerance has developed towards that mariological truth of Our Lady's co-redemption. When these people hear it, they react in exaggerated ways, in disordered ways, in hypersensitive ways to this Catholic teaching, which stems back to the course to scripture to the fathers which has always been taught by the church by the popes and is still a catholic truth today even though not yet def uh, defined dogmatically so what's the cause of this uh, if we may call it allergy why this allergic reaction today perhaps we don't know what the causes of uh, many allergies are medicine can only guess at it same thing here but often overexposure is involved in here. We could maybe speak of an overexposure not to healthy, traditional, maximalist Catholic Mariology, but to the exact opposite, an overexposure to a minimalist, Protestantized perception of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of her role in the economy of salvation. An overexposure to an incorrect Mariology can perhaps, can perhaps, can perhaps cause a hypersensitivity to that which is true Mariology, maximalist, healthy Catholic Mariology. One example, just to give you uh, today, a big name in modern day theology, Mariology, uh, will uh, uh, spare the name of this, uh, of this theologian. Besides, he's just one voice in a chorus of many such voices, uh, a chorus of uh, minimalist Mariology. One modern day Mariologist ventured to say that to promote the doctrine, of Marian co-redemption is, I quote, theologically inadequate, historically mistaken, pastorally an imprudence, and ecumenically unacceptable. If you want to make a career in Mariology today, say this, and you'll make, you know, you'll make, uh, you'll make progress. This is uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a consequence of that Marian minimalism which we're suffering from today. But if we look at the history of Mariology, if we look at the history of Mariology, we could say the same thing, theologically inadequate, historically mistaken, pastorally imprudent, ecumenically unacceptable about, about many Marian teachings, which then became dogmas. The divine maternity, Our Lady's divine maternity, was in the early centuries of the, of the church debated, contested, rejected. How can we say that a creature is the mother of God? It's theologically inadequate. How can any creature be the mother of God? It's impossible. Historically mistaken, pastorally an imprudence, ecumenically unacceptable. There was heresies that rejected this. But in the end, in the Council of Ephesus in 431, this truth was defined as a dogma. All difficulties ironed out and pacifically accepted and taught and believed by Catholics today. Same thing with the Immaculate Conception. Well, isn't Christ the Redeemer of all men, how can we say that Our Lady is Immaculate? Did she not need the Redeemer? How is that possible? Etc., etc. Debates went on until 1854. Blessed Pius IX put an end to the debate and defined it as dogma. Marian truths have to be understood correctly and above all with humility. Mariology takes humility. To understand Our Lady, it takes humility, which is lacking 
very often in today's minimalist Mariology, which apparently on the surface tries to, you know, to be humble, to exalt Christ, but in the end is pride because it rejects, it rejects the place that our Lord has given Our Lady in the economy of salvation. So since today it is the feast of the sorrows of Our Lady, sorrows by which we can say by the will of God, of course, always by the will of God, not by her own will, not by our will, but by the will of God, Our Lady became co-redemptrix, our co-redemptrix. And by co-redemptrix, we mean precisely that, that Our Lady, by her sufferings, contributed to freeing us from slavery to sin, to Satan, to death, and contributed to giving us new life, the life of grace, opening up to us the gates of heaven. This doesn't mean that she's our redemptrix instead of the Redeemer, no. It doesn't mean that she is greater than the Redeemer or not even equal to the Redeemer or independent of the Redeemer. It does not mean any of these things. Of course, always subordinated to Christ and with Christ, as the saints have taught, as the fathers have taught, as the popes have taught. And we cannot deny, whatever title we use to express the truth, we cannot deny it without falling into impiety, even though it's not yet a Catholic dogma, it's a part of ordinary Catholic magisterium. So let's look back at that objection. Why, you know, why why do theologians object that it's theologically inadequate, historically mistaken, pastorally imprudent, something that we we wouldn't want to believe in if that's the truth. But a brief response to such an objection, you know, uh, there's been treatises uh, written on Mary's co-redemption, co-redemption and rightly so, but just to give a brief answer to this objection, if we want to talk, uh, if we want to look at things from a theological, historical, and a pastoral point of view, we shouldn't be afraid to follow the doctrine of St. Irenaeus, for example, who calls Our Lady the cause of our salvation, and the other fathers who teach the same doctrine, shouldn't be afraid to follow the doctrine, the teaching, the example, the pastoral practice of the popes, Pope uh, Pius X, Benedict XV, Pius XI, St. John Paul II just very recently, who taught the same truth with these words, and all the other saints in between who weren't afraid to assert, to affirm this doctrine, who weren't afraid to use this title and give it to Our Lady, co-redemptrix of the human race. What we should be afraid of, rather, what we should be afraid of, you know, is falling into a compromise of faith, compromising our Mariology, our faith with mainstream non-confrontational theology, which taught one thing yesterday, when people like to hear it, another today, because that's what they want to hear today, and yet another tomorrow, who knows what that will be, according to the tastes of, the, of public opinion, according to what people want to hear, according to the itching of the ears of the world, as St. Paul said. And ecumenically, sure, for Protestants, it's a lot to digest, you know, to hear Our Lady being, co- being called co-redemptrix. But ecumenically, we shouldn't be afraid to prefer the bitter truth, which divides from us those who reject it, rather than embrace and espouse a sweet lie which unites us to those who profess it and unites us in a lie. So what's the antihistamine, if we want to call it that? What's, uh, what's the remedy for this allergy today if we don't want to fall victim to it? Or if we have and perhaps, you know, uh, we need um, something to help us get out of it. Well, it's healthy, maximalist, Catholic Mariology. According to the principle of the saints, Blessed John Duns Scotus, a Franciscan theologian, once said, how does he do his Mariology and how should we do it? He laid down the following principle. If it does not go against the authority of the church or that of scripture, it seems probable to attribute to Mary that which is more excellent. If it does not go against the authority of the church or that of scripture, it seems probable to attribute to Mary that which is more excellent. Why? Because Mary is a creature, the mother of God, whom God created for himself. Rightly, we believe that he created her as the most perfect mother, most perfect creature possible. And another Mariological Mariological principle is that Our Lady in everything imitates our Lord. Our Lord, a divine person, Our Lady imitates him in everything that a human person can achieve. And in everything that a human person can achieve, the divine person uh, cannot imitate the divine person of our Lord. That's why it's probable to attribute to Mary that which is more excellent. Does it contradict scripture to call Our Lady co-redemptrix? Certainly not. It's from scripture that we get this truth. When uh, the angel Gabriel calls Our Lady full of grace, a lot of truths are contained in this statement of the angel, full of grace. When does he say this? Even before the redemption, 
even before the incarnation, Our Lady is already full of grace. Of course, preserved by our Lord, redeemed by our Lord, or more correctly, saved by our Lord. She never fell into sin to be redeemed from. She was preserved and saved by our Lord. But once preserved, once saved, <clears throat> in our regards, while we were still in our sins, Our Lady already acts as one who is redeemed, who is saved, who is preserved. She participates in the cross of our Lord in a completely different way, in such a different way that she's able to, with her sufferings, contribute to our redemption, to pay the price for our redemption. That's what the gospel today refers to when St. Simeon says to Our Lady, and you and your own soul, a sword shall pierce that sort of suffering at the foot of the cross. And if St. Paul is able to say, in many places in his epistles, he says, I rejoice in the sufferings that I suffer for you. If he's able to say in the letter to the Galatians, I have been co-crucified with Christ, who more than Our Lady could say this, could say that she was spiritually crucified with her crucified son. These are words of St. John Paul II, co-crucified not for her sins, but for ours. It's a principle of a philosophy that an agent cannot pass from potency to act without being put into act by an agent already in act regarding that attribute or characteristic. Our Lady, who was preserved, redeemed before us, acted as such an agent in our regards. She who was already redeemed put us from help with our Lord to make us go from potency, from potentially redeemed, to redeemed, to saved by our Lord's blood and by her sufferings, united to our Lord's sufferings. Authority of the church certainly doesn't go against the authority of the church. It's taught by the authority of the church. Under St. Pius X, three times, three times the holy office in the sacred congregation of rites used this term, co-redemptrix, in a, in a hope that devotion to the merciful co-redemptrix of the human race may increase. This was 100 years ago. Pope Benedict XV used this term as well and also explained this theology in in probably the clearest words yet that a pope has used. Pope Benedict XV said, the doctors of the church state with one voice that the Blessed Virgin Mary was almost absent from the public life of Jesus Christ. She was invisible, almost absent. But in God's plan, she was present. She reappears again when he was in his death agony and nailed to the cross. To the same extent to which she almost died with her suffering and dying son, she abdicated her maternal rights over her son to save mankind and appease the justice of God. She almost died with her suffering and dying son, and she abdicated her maternal rights over her son to save mankind and to appease the justice of God. With every fiber of her being, the Pope goes on, she immolated her son, so that she may rightly be said to have redeemed the human race together with Christ. Never apart from Christ, never instead of Christ, she's not equal to Christ, but with every fiber of her being, she immolated her son, that she may rightly be said to with him have redeemed the human race. St. John Paul II went on to use at least five times this term, this Pope of Our Lady, and it is found in basically, if not in the term co-redemptrix, in its content, in its essence, in all the popes, in all the saints. It's a truth which, though not yet proclaimed a dogma, not, nonetheless is part of ordinary Catholic teaching. If it does not go against the authority of the church then or that of scripture, it seems probable to attribute to Mary that which is more excellent. And in this case, not only if it does not go against, but if it follows from scripture, if it follows from the fathers, if it follows from the authority of the church. To conclude, Our Lady's special work in the economy of salvation is undeniable. And the only title which really precisely expresses this truth and does justice to Our Lady is that of co-redemptrix. As strong as it is, it corresponds to the role that Our Lady, that Our Lord, that God assigned to Our Lady in the work of redemption, that of being a co-redemptrix. Not because she's greater than a redeemer or equal to him. We have to say this over and over again because, you know, allergic ears are listening. Not because she's greater than, equal to, or takes the place of the redeemer, but because with every fiber of her being, as a mother, she abdicated her maternal rights and immolated her son so that she may rightly be said 
to redeem the human race, human race with Christ. But let's also remember that there are two dimensions in the work of redemption, objective and subjective. In that work of redemption, worked by our Lord and by our Lady together, objectively we are all saved and redeemed, but that redemption will be of no use to us unless we apply it to ourselves subjectively. And how do we do that? There's no other way but than that of participating in our Lord's passion, participating in Our Lady's sorrows, sharing in those sorrows of Our Lady. So let's ask for that grace today to realize Our Lady's uh, role in our regards as our co-redemptrix with Christ and to put that and to apply those merits of hers and of her sons to our lives for our own salvation. How? By participating in her sorrows, by never departing from her or from her son, even unto Calvary. Praised be Jesus and Mary.